If you uh, listen to the news or radio or whatever, you might believe that man's greatest problem is the economy or his greatest problem is a lack of education or his greatest problem uh, is uh, prejudice or the greatest problem is this or the greatest problem is that. But the Bible's very, very clear about what man's greatest problem is, and it's very simple. It's simply sin. Because of all those things we've mentioned, there's only one thing that is capable, only one thing has the power to separate one from their God, and that's sin. Lack of education, no. The economy, no. Prejudice, no. But sin can separate one eternally from their God. We've been looking at the book of James on Sunday morning and we've got to the point in that book where James tells us about the progression of sin and then its awful consequences. In James chapter 1, I hope you've had a chance to have been reading from James chapter 1. This morning we're only going to look at three short verses. And those verses are James chapter 1 verses 13 through 15. Let's read those three verses. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. James says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Point number one comes from verse 13. Verse 13 tells us where the source of temptation comes from. It says the source of temptation is not God. Temptation does not come from God. Now, we've just talked about in the prior verses that God does test people, doesn't He? He tests people. Back in verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. God tests people. He tests their faith. He did that with Abraham. He did that with a number of people in the Bible. But God never tempts People. So what's the difference? Tempt has the idea of trying to, uh, trying to lure someone or entice someone to do wrong. The Bible said God never does that. He never tries to encourage someone to sin. The Bible is clear about who does that, though. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that, doesn't it? The devil's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How does he do that? He does that through sin. So he tempts people. Whenever we're tempted to sin, we know it's the father of lies who's doing that. We know it's Satan. He's like a lion. He's trying to devour us. How does he do that? He does that subtly. He doesn't throw a picture of what hell is like in front of us. No one would sin if that was the case. What does he do? He puts something attractive in front of us. See, that's how he entices people to sin. That's how he encourages them. He lures them with a bait, as he's going to show in a minute. He lures them. So he puts something very attractive in front of them. And that's how he gets people to sin. So God is not the source of sin. He never tempts anyone to do what's wrong. So whenever anyone does wrong, James tells us they can never blame God because God had nothing to do with it. God doesn't tempt anyone to do anything wrong. It comes from Satan. Verse 14 makes the point, and it's a very, very good one, about what the beginning of temptation is. He says one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires. 
So it all starts with desires. Desires aren't wrong. It's not desire, it's not wrong to want to eat or, or want to sleep or want to drink or want to, uh, uh, to rest. Those type of things aren't wrong. But there are desires that are ungodly. The Bible talks about a number of these. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 says, Put to death what is earthly in you. Put to death your earthly passions. Ephesians 4.22 calls them deceitful desires. Jude 18 calls them ungodly desires. Those desires are the ones that James is talking about. He says it's those desires that are the source of temptation. See, again, they come from Satan. There are good ways to meet the desire to eat. There's also wrong ways to do that. So our passions, our lusts can lead to temptation. How do we deal with those? In Titus chapter 2, Titus tells us what we need to do. Titus chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse 11. Notice what this says. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. What do we do? He says you deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Don't let them control you. Don't let them control you. You control them. How do we do that? He says you live soberly. You live in your right mind. You live righteously, you do what's right, and godly in the present age. And what are you supposed to be doing all the time? When you have desires, when you have passions, what do you do? You look for the blessed, glorious hope of the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, you keep your mind focused on what's right instead of focused on those desires. It says that's what you need to do. Is it possible? He says it is. He says it's possible. So we must be able to do it. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, when Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia, he gave them advice about how to handle this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of of the flesh. And then he talks about all those type of lusts in verse 17 and following. What do you have to do? You have to walk in the Spirit. That's how you keep from fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Those ungodly passions, deceitful desires. He says that's what you have to do. You have to walk in the Spirit. You have to walk in God's Word. You have to allow God's Word to control you. If God's Word controls you, then, then these ungodly desires and passions and lusts won't control you. God's Word will control you. What happens? He says there in James that <clears throat> one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. He's lured. He's enticed. You can imagine the, the fishing analogy here that James is certainly alluding to. You know, we, we see uh, some fish kind of hiding below a, a, a rock ledge, you know, below the water. All of a sudden, something appears before him. And it's something that particular fish finds attractive. It's alluring. That's why it's called allure. It's alluring. And the fisherman has dropped it down there to do what? To entice the fish to come out from under that rock and take the bait. 
And so he, fishermen might move it around some, push it up and down, whatever. So the fish will go after it. And then, of course, when the fish does and bites down on it, he gets hooked. Well, the Bible says that's what Satan does to us through these temptations. I understand you use, I'm not a fisherman, I understand you use different types of bait for different types of fish. What works for one fish doesn't work for another. A good fisherman knows what? The best type of bait to use for that type of fish. Guess what? Satan knows the exact same thing. He knows what to put in front of me to entice me. He knows what to put in front of you to entice you. So whatever it is that I find alluring or attractive or whatever, that's what Satan puts in front of me. To entice me. It's there in front of me. It looks good, just like it does to the fish. It looks very attractive. It looks like something I really want. The fish can't think. You and I can think. You and I can realize what is happening. We know what's going on. And we know it's something that we should stay away from. It's a temptation. No, there's nothing wrong with being tempted. Jesus was tempted countless times in his life. Every time, he knew what the temptation was. We read about those temptations in Matthew 4 when he's in the wilderness. But that wasn't the only time Satan tempted him. Satan tempted him throughout his life. Satan tempts us throughout our lives. And guess what? As we get older and our situation changes, you know what happens? The bait changes. Satan knows that. Because Satan knows that what might have tempted me when I was 14 doesn't tempt me now when I'm 51. And vice versa. What would tempt me now wouldn't have tempted me when I was 14. So Satan knows how those temptations, how those bait need to change over time if he's going to hook me. Satan knows that. Satan is the very best fisherman there ever has been. So he knows what's going to be attractive. But we also know the following. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're told by Paul through inspiration something that should be comforting to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verse 13. This is an extremely important verse to mark in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. In other words, He's trustworthy. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. That you may be able... To bear it. So God knows us. He knows us better than we do, right? He knows us. He knows the temptations that come our way every day. He knows all of those things. A Christian should never think that there's no options available. That he has to give in. No. There's a promise here that there's always a morally right solution. There's always a morally right choice. That's what that verse says. So regardless of, of the circumstances, the condition, whatever, there's always a way out. A morally acceptable way out. A way out that does not involve giving in to temptation. A way out that does not involve sin. That's what he tells us. There is always a way out. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, <clears throat> we're told this, we're promised this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Do you hear what he said? The Lord knows 
how. He knows how to do that. He gives us options. He gives us choices. We never... Now, you think back at your life as, as, as long as you can. Was there ever a temptation that you had to give in to? That you had to? There was no choice, no options? I, I guarantee that you can't think of one. There's always a way out. Always. And that's a promise. He also tells us not to, you know, purposefully put ourselves in places of temptation. Do you know for yourself places that you shouldn't go or people you shouldn't be around? Because if you go to those places or be with those people, you might be tempted to do wrong. So what does God tell us to do? Well, stay away from those places and those people. Don't purposefully go to those places or be with those people. If the temptation is going to be strong, don't do it. He says stay away from those people. Wonderful advice. But there's always a way out. And then the third point we find in verse 15 it says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Now he changes the illustration, doesn't he? He, he was a, it was kind of a fishing or hunting type uh, illustration. Now he changes it to the, to the birth process. Because he says, when desire has conceived, there's the conception process, it gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it's full grown, reaches adulthood, brings forth death. What happens? What must happen for conception? Well, two separate things have to come together, right? And that's what he's talking about here. When our will, when my mind and my will and so forth, come together with Satan's temptation, that allurement, and they combine, they unite, what happens? Sin is the ugly offspring. That's what he says. Sin's the ugly offspring. So when desire conceives, the result is sin. Satan is inviting you to sin. You don't have to unite with him. But if you choose to, if your will gives in to him, the result is is sin. Sin is born. There's a lot of places in the, in the Old Testament in particular that uses this type of analogy. We'll just look at one. Psalm 7. Psalm 7. And in particular, we'll read verse 14. Psalm 7, verse 14. Notice how this illustration is used in verse 14. Psalm 7, verse 14 says this, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity, gives birth to. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth, gives birth to, falsehood. Satan is inviting you through the temptation to a union with him. And that union brings sin. And then what does he say? When sin is full grown, if we allow sin to grow and develop and mature, what does he say is the inevitable end? Death. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 So if we allow sin to continue to grow and develop, and we do nothing to stop it, it will produce death. Notice, we don't die immediately. We're not eternally separated from God immediately upon sinning. And that's because of God's grace and mercy. We're not. 
When we sin, though, here's the two options that James says is here. There's two options when we sin. We can allow sin to grow and develop and mature. That's one choice. That choice leads to spiritual death, eternal separation. That's one choice. The other choice is to kill sin, kill that ugly offspring. The only two options. We either kill it or we let it grow. James says you've got to kill it. You have to kill sin. Otherwise, it leads to death. How do we do that? How do we kill sin? Well, the Bible says it's pretty clear. 1 John chapter 1 tells us how we do that. 1 John chapter 1, <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 6. And think about how this applies to sin and how we cannot let it grow and develop. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I want to kill sin, what do I have to do? I have to confess that I have sinned. If I never confess my sins, what am I doing? I'm allowing sin to grow and develop and mature and if I never confess them and ask for forgiveness, what happens? Spiritual death. Eternal separation. So how do I kill sin? I confess that sin and ask God for forgiveness. And that kills that sin. That sin is dead. And that sin will never grow anymore. That sin is gone. So those are my choices. When sin comes into my life, when I allow myself to be enticed and lured, and I take hold of that sin, and that, that, that desire gives birth to sin, and I allow sin to grow, the only outcome is spiritual death. But that's not the inevitable outcome. I can kill that sin by confessing that sin and asking God for forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1 is written to Christians, to people who have already been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, who've already been born again, who've already uh, been buried with Him in baptism. For the child of God, we must kill sin immediately by confessing that wrong and asking for forgiveness. Yes, Jesus invites you, number one, to be born again. Number two, to come to Him, to come confessing wrongs, come asking for forgiveness. Because if we don't, sin will just grow and mature until it leads to spiritual death. This morning, as David leads us in a song, think about your relationship with Christ. Are you letting sin just grow and grow and develop in your lives? Or do you daily kill sin? If it's the former, we especially encourage you to come. Please stand as we sing this song.